Back in Ephesians. Friends, I think if we were <coughs> giving it much thought or consideration, we'd acknowledge that we are so used to hearing certain phrases and words, it becomes easy to actually think we know what they're telling us, how they're being used. But in the end, we are not as intentional, perhaps, to meditate about their significance to our everyday lives. I would say this is actually especially true as Christians. Even the most faithful here can and often find it difficult to hear with attention and focus what is preached out of God's word week to week. Now let me be clear. This is not to say there's no interest. But it takes intentionality and focus and quite frankly a humility to recognize that just because I've heard certain words or phrases, in my case for a lifetime of 51 years, for some of you more, for some of you less, that I and we still have much to learn and much to submit to with understanding. In other words, what the message of God's Word tells us is, is basically a fundamental truth. So much of the story of the Scriptures, however, is helping us understand, first of all, God himself better, meaning who, who's telling us the story? Why is the storyteller and the central character to the story so important? That's part of it. But the other part of it is reading about <coughs> what everyday normal looks like while following it. Because our very nature, and I really hope you understand this, <coughs> Joel, could you give me some water? Excuse me. Dry throat, not COVID. Just so you know. um, we are so prone by nature to just let myself's determination of any given day or moment to be what rules. And it is so hard for us, no matter how many years of our lives we have heard the message of the gospel, to really understand it is about correcting a major wrong. And that wrong is, is that I'm never supposed to rule. I'm never supposed to be the one that determines something. God is. And he's so much better at it than I. But it's really hard thanks for that, to really, really let that sink in and live by it. It's hard to let that sink into all the parts of our everyday normal. Don't get me wrong. For example, this. The more this becomes a part of your every week normal, you're ingrained to just do it. And that's a good thing. But perhaps, for example, the way your everyday normal responds to stress, the gospel's not present. Or the way that we respond to uh, a person in our lives doesn't include the gospel. Or the way that we realize and know deep down we should work through forgiveness with somebody, but we just don't want to. Little piece by little piece, there are things in our everyday normals that we just don't want to bring the gospel to, or we don't know how to. So I say all that to say this. One, one function of Paul's letter is to help the church in its infancy, because remember, at this point, the church itself, as a aspect, as a a part of God's overall plan. At this point in time, when Paul writes this letter, the church is at best 30 years old. So Paul, one of the functions of his letter is to help the church in its infancy to better understand the words of our faith, the facts and beliefs of our faith, in such a way that we can start working with the Spirit to incorporate and use these things in our everyday ordinary for God's glory and purpose. 
Now, I didn't plan on this. God kind of gave it to me, and it's especially going to be pleasant to you music lovers, but here we go. This is what I want you to think about, what Paul is trying to do. Many of you probably don't know that when I was young, I actually played an instrument. I used to play the trumpet. And I did that all the way up until my freshman year in high school. Why I stopped, that's another story for another day. You just need to understand I did it. And one of the things I got to do because of the school district I was in, I got to participate in a couple of the different bands. Not only the normal, what they would call maybe just concert band, I got to be in the marching band, and I got to be part of the jazz band. Now here's what I want you to understand. Learning something, whether it's a sport or skill, but I think music actually helps paint this picture the best. I can learn how to play the trumpet, I can learn notes, and I can learn how to then obviously play a song. That is the basic elements of the Christian faith. Okay? Are you with me so far? You can learn the basic parts to it, and you can, to a degree, adequately play the basic things. But have any of you ever, ever heard just the sweet smoothness of a jazz trumpet player? See, if you don't like music, I get it. You're going to be like, what? You know. Jesse, help me out here. Yeah. Have you ever... What's it like? What's the difference between a basic and a jazz smooth sound play? And here's the thing. God ultimately, his desire is for us to be jazz players with our faith. I'll never forget where we were doing um, rehearsal for a concert, for, uh, I'm sorry, for a jazz band competition. And you would compete against different jazz bands. And one of the differences between that kind of competition and any other is that what makes jazz jazz in part is, yes, there's the primal aspect of the song, but then they want instruments, various instruments, saxophones, trombones, <coughs> trumpets, to be able to just start improvising. And you know what? I stunned at it. <laughs> I couldn't do it. But that's what I'm talking about. That's the stuck point that a lot of us get in our everyday normal, is we don't know how to bring the gospel into our everyday normal so that it's just a smooth sound and that it is an improvisation it is something but the, remember for jazz an improvisation still fits the song it's not like it's just random notes that you throw together and hope it sounds okay it's that you somehow understand your instrument the notes the song in such a way that you get to actually produce something that fits the moment Friends, that's exactly what Paul is wanting to help the church do better at. Is to take the basic elements, the basic truths of our faith and encourage us to learn how to take it so that no matter what comes up in our everyday normal, we can play our faith in such a way that it fits. So, with all that in mind, let's pray and we'll dig into Ephesians 5. Blessed Father, Guide our steps, I pray. Help us in this journey of faith. Help us to really consider what it is about life and what it is about faith that you want to see tied together. And help us give ourselves to it, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. In chapter 5, if you go back to verses 1 and 2, so let me reread those again. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. From this point forward, the rest of the letter unpacks how we do that. Now, obviously, that's also actually true of the whole chapter 4. So when it, Paul talked about putting off, putting on, that's another way of saying this. Paul just keeps using in some at different points in chapters 4, 5, and 6, different ways to help us understand what he's doing. And what he's doing is he's trying to help us get to that understanding. I'm to take chapters 1 through 3 and live it in such a way that I am imitating God 
and I'm walking in this life like Jesus did. That's what Paul's after. So, in, in other words, Ephesians 4 through 6 are all about how we move from being children of wrath, which is after chapter 2. Uh, if you want to understand what being a child of wrath means, I can give it to you in a nutshell. Being a child of wrath is a person who says, I believe I make a better God than you. God. That is, anyone who lives that way, anyone who functions that way, that person is a child of wrath. And therefore, Ephesians 4 through 6 is, how do we move from being a child of wrath to being a child of of God. Interesting enough, therefore, Ephesians 1 through 3 explains the theology and relationship God creates to make chapters 4 through 6 possible. It's a complete letter, it's a complete message. And Paul wants us to understand that imitating God as loved children is to walk in love as Christ did. Well, then the question is, how did Christ walk in love? It says that he loved God through his submissive obedience and loved others by sacrificing himself for God's glory. This is what we are to do. Paul explains what in ordinary life needs to go away, what needs to grow and be added, how to do that in relationship with God and others. So let's just keep it simple. You're going along in life and you come across a moment in your everyday life where all of a sudden it just doesn't fit. The more you grow in your faith and the more that you're wrestling with God, you realize that thing in your everyday ordinary doesn't belong anymore. Or it feels off. Let the wrestling begin. Because now it's a matter of wrestling within our own selfish heart with our renewed heart of faith. Am I going to obey God? Am I going to submit to God? Or am I going to wrestle and hold on to that thing? And there are some days and weeks where that's all it feels like I'm doing is wrestling with God. And there are other days when hopefully it's a little bit more at peace. And that's part of what, you know, messages where it says God doesn't give us more than we can handle. We get a little too caught up in the extremes of that. Instead of understanding that has more to do with everyday little. God does not overwhelm us to change ten big things. Oftentimes it's four or five little things. But the point is, is that if we love God and believe in him, he is going to keep bringing before you things that need to increase or things that need to decrease. Things that need to be put away and put off and things that need to be put on. And a lot of our internal stress therefore comes from the fact that we're just not wanting to do it God's way. I don't want to oversimplify it, but there is a simplicity in it. It's just the, what's hard is the doing. What's hard is the submitting. What's the hard is acknowledging that God's way actually is better than mine. And I actually would tell you, take a deep breath. We're all in this together. We all struggle with it. I don't want to say it's okay, but I do want to make it clear. It's normal. Part of our normal is wrestling with God. That's why he's so full of grace. And mercy. Well, I shouldn't say that's why. It's part of his expression of grace and mercy. He is so very patient with us. And the good news is he knows our hearts better than we do. So, Paul wants us to really grasp the significance and depth of our faith in our everyday world. So then, all of this leads to, in chapter 5, verse 15, look carefully then how you walk, or how you live. Now we're starting to get to the nitty-gritty of intentionality. Now we're slowly getting more and more to the part of our role. You see, up until this, a lot of it is God telling us, first of all, what he has done to enable a wonderful, amazing relationship. And then 
he then explains, he starts explaining how we live in that new relationship. But a key part of that then slowly comes down to this one verse. Look carefully then how you walk or live. Walk and live are oftentimes regularly synonymous. They're the same thing. So the first thing you're going to want to ask is why. Why should we walk carefully? Well, the first thing I need to tell you then is we can't claim to do or live verses 1 and 2 of chapter 5, imitating God and loving as Christ loved, if we are living in such a way that is characterized by selfishness. You can't say to someone, I am walking carefully, I am imitating God, if I have a way of living in everyday normal that is just characterized moment by moment, day by day, by self-centeredness. Love God's way cannot abide with ongoing careless selfishness. Now, I, I have to make sure I'm, I'm doing my job well. I need to remind you, this isn't about behavioral or moral perfection. I said a life that's characterized. And I, you don't need, I, I, I loathe to use percentages because we get too caught up in numbers and comparatives. So a, a life characterized by holiness is a heart and mind that is trying to understand, learn, and do God's thing, God's way. A life characterized by selfishness is a life that actually rarely, if ever, considers God. You fill in the gaps. See, the church wants a percentage. So you're saying, Pastor, if I give 55% to caring about God's way, then I'm okay. Yeah, no, because the very idea that you're thinking of it that way tells me you're not looking for submission. You're looking for an insurance policy. Living a life that is characterized by seeking after God isn't worried about the percentages. It isn't even worried where the line is. It's actually saying, oh, God, oh, God, help me to get as far away from my self-centeredness as possible. Knowing full well that as I say that, Anyone that says that, in all earnest, is about to make a mad sprint away from selfishness. And they take about ten strides and then, whoop, something comes along and they're like, that's normal. But what we're talking about is a person that literally just stands here in the world of selfishness. And maybe looks up to God once in a blue moon, if ever. And they look at their fellow man, and their first question is always, what's my benefit? What will it cost me? Paul says here, walk carefully. Well, then he goes on, and it's understanding this. Men, the most man-enabled thing you can do is to serve your family in church. Men, it takes humble strength to live in a life following another. And by that other, obviously I mean God. I would like to also add that it's someone greater than ourselves, which is actually a nice thing. We're not following, like, you're not, I'm not saying follow me. I would never want you to do that. I am neither worthy nor capable. But to follow God, to follow Christ, men, there's nothing more masculine, there's nothing more defining of being men than living the life we've been given for God, under God. Ladies, in the day and age when you're be being told, and quite frankly, in, at least in certain places, in a proper way, but unfortunately, in many places, and not so proper, the most womanliest thing you could ever do is to serve your family in church. <gasps> yes, ladies. Submission. Once again, it takes tremendous courage and strength to give to others with a Christ-empowered confidence, understanding you're not submitting unto men, you're submitting unto the Lord. Paul unpacks 
this statement of walking carefully with three factors in verses 15 to 16. First of all, he says, walk or live carefully in how you live. Number one, not as unwise, but wise. If you remember in chapter one, that was actually part of Paul's prayer in the beginning of the book. He says that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Paul, there are certain phrases and ideas that he keeps bringing up in the letter. That's important. If he, if he repeats wisdom, okay, we need to consider that. And Paul is saying here, look carefully at how you live, not as one that is unwise, but as wise. Well, first of all, where does wisdom come from? It comes from the Lord. All right, what else? Number two, making the best use of the time. And number three, the days are evil. These are three factors he wants us to keep in mind as he says, walk carefully. Well, wisdom, let's start there, has always been the growth of knowing God and his ways while incorporating them into everyday living with growing effectiveness. Listen, there are people who are um, – oh, I can get in so much trouble um, – not mentally acute, they, they just don't engage life with their brains. And here's the thing, like I've had people talk, like I'll be talking with them and I talk about how much I read and they say how much they hate to read. And immediately you almost feel the, the divide in the room as if I have, I do something that's greater than. And it's like, listen, intelligence is not based on the fact that you're capable of being a doctor versus being uh, a plumber, let me tell you, I've watched, by the way, just in this last week, somebody that expresses the genius of plumbing. Are, are you with me here? They can do plumbing. I look at plumbing and I go, oh my goodness, I'm going to blow up the house. I mean, there's just, there's nothing about it that I get. So if you can do that, to me, you're a genius. We have created in society this division of intelligence. Instead of understanding that, yes, all of us have different giftings with how our brain works, what it connects to, and therefore what we're good at. And if you're good at medical science, God be praised, he gave you that gift, wonderful. But doctors are no greater to the society than somebody who can do plumbing. So when I talk about intelligence or stuff, I'm talking about an intentionality of understanding that life does require mental engagement. That you just can't sit on the couch, drool, and be okay. With that being said, understanding that wisdom is not simply an intelligence of understanding information. So let's go back to what I said at the beginning. There are a lot of us that sit in church week after week, and we understand the words and phrases of our faith intelligently. The challenge that Paul puts before us is do you understand it with wisdom? And let me say wisdom again. According to the Bible, in all of Scripture, here's what wisdom is. It's the growth of the intelligence of knowledge of God and his ways while incorporating them into everyday living with growing effectiveness. That's wisdom. So go back to my analogy about playing music. I could play the notes, I could play even the basic song, but when it came to the... Uh, uh, improvisation within the song, I wasn't there yet. I still needed more wisdom. I needed to keep growing in my understanding of how to use the instrument within the song for an effective way. Friends, that's our everyday journey of faith. Paul says, walk carefully. How? By being wise as opposed to unwise. Now, what's interesting then is that Growing in wisdom comes about when we make the best use of the time God gives each day. We need to be more intentional with understanding that each moment in the ordinary is a potential opportunity for God's power and grace to be lived in and witnessed both by our own eyes and hearts and that of others. We cannot afford to be passive friends against evil, but rather more intentional in pursuing God and his good. Making the most of our days is understanding that in our everyday normal, we have a variety of opportunities to take our faith and use it. 
The simplest application I can tell you? Our temperament. I didn't just say temper, our temperament. Our mood. Our moods need more gospel application on every given stinking second than we realize. But we like to let our moods fly. We like them to be free. We let them go. And then we wonder why our home is chaos or people are mad or people are upset or whatever. Because if we give free reign to me, it's not going to be a good day. It's just not. Yes, there are times when me is a great guy. But there's a lot of times when I'm not so much. To give free reign with no intentional direction, wisdom, making the most use of the time. To let the gospel matter to me in a moment, every moment, is what Paul is saying, is walking carefully. Make use of the time. Spouses, make use of the time. Parents with children, make use of the time. But he isn't just saying, hey, have a good time. Go on a date. Go that. That's all part of it. But what he's saying is, whatever you do in those times with your spouse, with your children, with your church, with your Co-workers, whatever you're doing, make use of it. So what he's saying is, take this gospel of chapters 1 through 3 and bring it with you. Let it affect your thinking. Let it affect your reactions. Let it affect your choices in those moments. And then that final factor, which leads... Basically is a good, by the way, good why for the second. Why do we need to make the best use of our time? Well, because if we're growing in carefully walking as an imitator of God by making the best use of the time God gives us, it is an acknowledgement that the days are, in fact, full of evil. We have always the potential for evil, and we are surrounded by people with the potential for evil. And unfortunately, we've listened to Hollywood a little bit too much, and we understand too quickly that evil is always the worst of the worst, and instead of understanding that evil is very simple. Evil is the practice of selfish rule versus God's rule. It's that basic. That's evil. And we don't want to think of it that way. We don't want to think that if I choose myself over God in any given moment, I'm being evil. I don't want to see myself that way. So even good Christians who understand sin and understand the need of Jesus to overcome our sin, we don't like to still see and understand our ability to be evil. Because selfishness is an evil thing. Paul says the days are evil, so therefore we are literally constantly surrounded by the reality of evil. Let me just tell you, friends, it is actually a, a wisdom understanding of that phrase, the days are evil, that helped the new, throughout the New Testament to understand we are in the last days, and we have been since Jesus ascended to his throne. We have been in the last days for over 2,000 years. For all of the New Testament, if you think about it, there is the present age and the coming age. It's constantly being presented that way. Present age, coming age. So just as we finished studying over the last month, we await the second advent, the return of the king. But while we do so, we live in evil times. There isn't an age since Jesus ascended that hasn't wondered, is this it? Because something was happening in their world that was horrific. And I am not trying to minimize our horrific. I'm just telling you. We have been living in evil times. And it just goes up and it goes down. And it's terrible at times. And you think, oh, how can it be any worse? And then about ten years later we go, oh, that's how. I'm not kidding. So for some of you that are a little bit on the younger side, let me just say this. When a certain president named Bill Clinton was elected, conservatives practically crawled the walls and wondered if it was time to move to Canada. Does that sound familiar? I mean, we always think in the immediate moment, when we look at the immediate moment and put it under a microscope, we think, oh, it's terrible. 
And it is. And don't get me wrong. It's not like it's been fun. I would like to check out of the COVID world for a few days, please. And all that comes with it. But Paul says, you live in evil times. Make the use of your days. Walk carefully and be peaceful. And that was his word to the church of Ephesus. That's his word to us today. How important is it for all who believe in God through faith in Jesus to walk carefully, full of wisdom, intentionally using our time with our spouses, our kids, our jobs, our community, and above all else, in service to the kingdom, to the local church, because we live in evil times and the world needs to see God's kingdom. It needs to see God's church. So this is what is meant by Paul, to walk carefully and not be foolish, but instead, as we live out of verses 15 to 16, here's what, what happens. We start to grow in our understanding of what the will of the Lord is for us, verse 17. The more intentional we are giving our lives to God in our everyday normal, what God wants of us becomes more clear. And sometimes it's a generic what I simply mean by that is it's something that any and every believer could do. And sometimes it is a little bit more specific. Sometimes it is a location. As I told you uh, a couple weeks ago, Geek and I had no idea after seminary and the entire year that we spent in that proverbial limbo that we would end up in upstate New York. That was nowhere near our, our thinking. But God did. God got us here. He did certain steps and things with people. Friends, that's the way it works. The more we give ourselves in our everyday normal, God helps us understand what he's doing in our life and around us. Um, because believers have already learned Christ, chapter 4, verse 20, and are now light in the Lord, chapter 5, verse 8, they must seek to determine what is pleasing to the Lord, chapter 5, verse 10, by doing his will. That was one commentator's way of summarizing all of this. Foolishness in the Bible has always been about not seeking God. When the Bible calls someone a fool, they're basically saying there's somebody who thinks they're better than God, doesn't need God, and therefore that's the definition of fool. We personally avoid foolishness when we intentionally seek God in his ways. If we leave it to chance, we are being foolish, which fits God's command. Instead, the opposite of that is to walk carefully, or another way of saying it is walk intentionally. Here's the rub. Walking intentionally is hard to do in everyday normal. What's a great example of that? The New Year's resolution. Why do we do New Year's resolutions? Because we realize that our everyday normal needs correcting, course correcting. So we go through this game in our heads and say, I'm going to make a resolution to do this change for a day. And then I'm going to go back to that, new norm, that, that normal. Paul is trying to push us out of our normal and understand Walk intentionally in your normal and watch God do amazing things. One of my favorite examples of that out of the scriptures is Moses. Moses basically lived three 40-year phases of life. First phase was as a prince. Last phase was as a leader of a nation. What was the phase in the middle? Holy shepherd. He spent 40 years just sitting Watching the sheep. Okay, maybe not always sitting. But the point is, is that his everyday normal was watching sheep for 40 years. After, after 40 years of being a prince. Yeah, how's that go for you? I mean, we put these characters, these people in the story of God's word and exalt them and think, Woo, what wonderful, amazing people. Moses went from being a prince to a shepherd. For years. You want to talk about monotonous, boring, simple. 
and yet God called him to that for 40 years for a reason. Friends, I don't know what's in your everyday normal. I know some of your kids and your spouses, so I think your life's okay. But anyways, a little more lively than you might want to acknowledge. But my point would be, our everyday normal, whether it's a routine we get tired of, or whether it's relationships we think we're getting weary of, I am here to tell you, if God is in it, there's nothing boring or humdrum about it, because in every moment is the potential of God's glory exploding. There are a variety of moments in our 27 years of being married that Jeek and I would love to have rewritten or redo. But with that being said, our everyday normal is full of wonder because God's in it. Our three kids, full of amazing wonder because God's in it, not because of us. God just wants to take our normal and use it. Verse 18, Paul then uses a common picture to help the church understand the only way they can accomplish his instructions is through the indwelling power and leading of the Holy Spirit. What's really interesting is that in this letter, and really I, I, I have to laugh at the conservative church a little bit at how it tends to use this verse, because it rips it out of its context and uses it in such a way incorrectly. So therefore, what I find fascinating is here. This picture Paul is using is for a reason. Uh, in order to understand how we can walk carefully, Paul uses a term Christians would have understood at the time, and that's debauchery. All right, We don't use it that often, so just in case, let me catch you up to speed on this. Debauchery in its simplicity, out of the scriptures you have at Titus 1.6, 1 Peter 4.4, 4, it means this. Simply put, debauchery means a behavior which shows lack of concern or thought for the consequences of the action. Let me say it again. Debauchery is a behavior that we do, which by doing it shows a lack of concern or thought for the consequences of doing such action. In other words, what Paul is saying is that drunkenness can very well lead to stupidity of a whole different scale. You forget where you parked the car. You forget the people you came with. You forget your pants. I mean, there are so many things you end up forgetting because your choices of the alcohol consumption was at such a level where now you're engaging in debauchery. And all that means is, is you're so bombed out of your brain, you no longer are using rational thought or caring about whatever it is you do. And so it's great when you get up on the piano and sing a song and everyone goes, wow, that was actually really good. But in most cases, debauchery goes nowhere good. And Paul is simply using this example to say, don't be led by drunkenness. Be led by the Spirit. And I would tell you there's two reasons he's doing this. Number one is, is that it was a common thing in the religions of the day to include drinking in their worship. And let me just say, some people worship really well. Some of you will get that later. Call me when you do. The other reason he's using it is because it's a contrast to the call to live wisely. So he's using this simple example, not only to do it as a, a contrast to false, misleading religions, he's using it to help them understand, look, being led of the Spirit leads you to wisdom. It leads you away from foolishness. Paul doesn't want them to follow the path of foolishness. He wants them to follow the path of wisdom. Wisdom is walking carefully. So if we do this, verse 18, be led by the Spirit, that then leads to verses 19 to 21. Being led by the Holy Spirit will produce a certain mindset and heart attitude that will make walking carefully more fulfilling and genuine. All right, real quick. First, being led by the Holy Spirit will produce a different fellowship of worship. Fellowship of worship. The heart of our worship will be more free, humble, and united. And Paul uses psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs of our hearts will be expressed to one another. Now, 
I, I will say this. I, I don't think Paul is necessarily saying that, therefore, every time believers get together, that the way they encourage each other is that they literally break out an actual song with one another. If you're Amy Aubrey, you will do that, and that's okay. That's who she is, and she does it quite well, far better than I do. I'm not probably going to walk up to you and start breaking out in just as I am or something, okay? But what Paul's trying to get at is that if I'm being led of the Spirit, the, the heart within me, the mindset within me is going to have a growing aspect of joy and, and peace and hope. Oftentimes that can be expressed through song. And therefore, Paul is just getting at this idea that how we encourage each other. Because songs were a great encouragement. And sometimes people probably did in that culture. Friends, let's be honest. We are a little bit distant from an aspect of real community aspect. Like we're, we do an okay job, but we're really just used to doing things solo. You know, I mean, that's just kind of our use to mindset. In a society that is really bound by community, the idea of just getting together, enjoying, sitting on the porch, rocking and talking, and sometimes they would just break out in song together. I mean, that would be something they would do. But it was meant to be done together as a mutual encouragement Together. Which then leads to the second thing he talks about, which is as we address one another in unity and grace in a corporate way, being led by the Spirit then helps us make melody in our heart also to the Lord corporately and privately. So in other words, the first thing Paul's getting at is how we horizontally encourage each other, and then the second one is how we jointly together or personally exalt and enjoy God. Which then leads to the third one. Walking carefully, being led, filled by the Holy Spirit, results in a lasting, genuine thankfulness to God for his ongoing provision and presence, even in the midst of hardship. If I am growing in wisdom, if I am walking carefully, making the most of every opportunity, part of that is going to literally grow within me a thankful heart. Why? Because I'm going to see God at work more. I'm going to see how he is present more. I'm going to be more aware of all that he's doing. Verse 21 offers the clearest, I think, directive we will ever need to understand that being an imitator of God, loving as Jesus loves, being led of the Spirit, all involves this one thing. Every each believer submitting themselves to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now let me just tell you right at the beginning, this phrase actually produces a lot of difficulty for theologians and Bible scholars, whatever, because they struggle to understand how I can be submissive to all of you. So therefore, what a lot of Bible teachers will do is they'll say that phrase, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ, is simply a lead-in to then the three relationships he talks about, uh, wives, children, and masters. The problem I have with that is that it says submitting to one another. So I'm not ready to go that side of the, the river. I, I would tell you, for me personally, I believe this is a general directive for each believer to work through and wrestle with. Just because it's difficult doesn't mean that we make it easy. As Paul moves deeper into the rest of the letter, he's going to show us key relationships that allow us actually to practice this submission more easily to God in Christ because of Christ. But here, the simple truth is stated. We show ourselves growing in our understanding of God's will as we learn to practice submission to one another out of reverence for Christ. For me personally, I, for example, do not submit to Joel and Nate, and quite frankly to you as a church, because of me or because I'm a great guy. I do it because I'm supposed to according to Christ. So there are times where I will submit to Joel and Nate and some of the other elders over the last 20 years about certain things that I maybe didn't want to do or agree with 100%, but 
But because I couldn't see a reason biblically not to do it, I'm going to submit out of reverence to Christ to their thought, suggestion, desire, whatever. I'm not saying learning this particular submission to one another out of reverence for Christ is easy. I'm telling you, it is hard. But the more we wrestle with it, the more we are going to understand God's will. Because God's will included sending his son to the cross. If you think that's easy, then I would tell you you're sadly mistaken. So within God's plan, he sends his son to the cross. His son has to work through that in his own flesh and obey. And it is that same picture that we are then called to. A martyr, every single martyr that has ever died, submitted themselves to the brethren and to what was happening out of reverence for Christ. Yeah, this is a difficult thing. Submitting to a situation. And once again, immediately we start thinking in two extremes. Does that mean um, I submit to every aspect of abuse or mistreatment and all these other things? And that's one extreme we fall on. The other extreme, therefore, would be is that, yes, we just lay down for everything um, or or submission requires us to be completely abandoned of what it means to be an individual. And my point would be to tell you, it's our nature that wants to explain the extreme as if we live there. And just about everything Jesus wants out of us has to do with the everyday normal. So that's really the question you need to ask yourself. What is, where is your everyday normal? And what out of it requires a godly submission out of reverence for Christ? to the various people around you. Dads, there's an aspect where we actually submit to our children, but it's not because we do things their way, it's that we have to give up some of ourselves, our time, our energy, in order to raise them. That's being submissive. It's being submissive to the responsibility that they require. If I'm going to have kids, I'd better be aware of the fact that that's going to require some submission on my part. See, some of it's how we think of submission. We think submission means I do what they want. That's not what it's saying. It's saying submitting to an understanding of their need, what I have available to give that I may not want to give. But ultimately, the key part of the phrase is out of reverence to Christ. Jesus gave up everything. Am I prepared to do the same for God through all of you, my relationship with you? That's what we're dealing with. That's what we're wrestling with. So let me land this plane. It's interesting um, where it says the idea of this, that our posture of mutual submission is eternally motivated and part of walking carefully in our daily normal as we seek to imitate God. It's actually learning to have a posture in our hearts of submission. Calvin said it this way, God has bound us so strongly to each other that no man ought to endeavor to avoid subjection. And where love reigns, mutual services will be rendered. Spouses, if you both love and believe in Jesus, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ, that means both parties. Now, how that's lived out, Paul's going to get into as we get deeper into chapter 5, which will be really fun. Um, and we'll get into that in the weeks to come. But, submission. Dear friends, let me just close it this way. Paul's words are both clear and important to our everyday normal. We need to live life on purpose, which is God's purpose. And to do so will require taking care of our choices in every aspect of our daily normal and ordinary. God shows up in the ordinary and normal when we are being led by the Spirit, practicing wisdom, making the most of our minutes and hours, while keeping perspective within the context we're living that it includes evil times. God is seen through our genuine thankfulness within our normal hardships. God is seen in our encouragement of one another. 
God is seen when we submit ourselves to another. I used to love the picture of the knight and how if two, if two knights met on the road or if a prince and a knight met on the road, the knight had to consider the order of rank. And the knight would say, sir, you have the road. And it's a little bit like that. Whereas we come across a person in our day, daily normal, we have to, the first thought in our minds are, do I need to give them the road? Is that serving the kingdom well? Is it easy? No. Walking careful is not about shame, guilt, or perfection. Walking carefully is about our intentionally learning the will of the Lord with the Spirit's help, using wisdom to know how to then submit my ordinary to his will in all of its little moments. And the more I do that, the more the music I play is smooth and fits the song God has given me. Walking carefully, friends, it, it takes intentionality. It takes willful submission. But it is so worth it. The journey is so worth it. That's what Pilgrim's Progress and so many other things is trying to tell us. It's not about achieving perfection. It's not about figuring it out, and once I get it, I've mastered it. And there's no such thing. It's about walking every day in my all-the-time normal, watching God show up in it. Wow. Blessed Father, help us, I pray, with our everyday normal. <clears throat> Help us to understand that that is, in fact, where you want to show up. And therefore, Lord, help us to let you. Help us to get out of the way. Help us to be more wise and less foolish. Help us to make the most of our time, understanding the evil around us, learning what your will is, and practicing the oh-so-very-different submission to one another out of reverence. Teach us, Lord, and we ask this in Jesus' name.